Variability in, in just general terms means how different are the different observations you make. You, you have a, a bunch of sampling units, quadrats or, or lines or points, <clears throat> and we go out to measure something, and it means how much difference is there from one to the other. Hello, my name is Lamar Smith. Uh, we're out here close to uh, Sarita Road today, uh, just uh, southeast of Tucson. And uh, what I want to talk about uh, here is some of the concepts about sampling variability and why that's important in monitoring. I think it's important to remember when we're monitoring, the, the most essential thing is that we need to know that the measurements we take at one time can be repeated later on at another time without introducing some kind of error due to personal bias or sampling variability. Now, there's two ways uh, that happens, and one has to do with uh, how big a sample do we need, what the, what the sampling variability is, and the other has to do with the ground rules or how we measure things. I'll deal with ground rules in another part of this discussion. But sampling variability uh, is a major problem in range sampling and uh, means that we have to have a repeatable sample in order to uh, get something we know is a real change over time. And I'll deal with how we do that. Uh, measurements can be precise without necessarily being accurate. That is, they can be repeatable, and that's the thing that's important in monitoring. So sometimes we use a method that we know is only just an approximation of the real value, but it is something we can measure uh, repeatably. Okay, I'm just going to give you a little uh, illustration of the difference between accuracy and precision. If this was a target that we were shooting a rifle at, you can see these rocks represent where the bullets hit. If the bullseye is right in the middle, we're shooting all around that bullseye, the average of it would be pretty uh, right on the money. So that, that is accurate shooting, it's not very precise. Over here is another example where all the shots are off to one side of the bullseye, but then a nice tight little group. That's precise shooting. That's repeatable shooting, but it's not hitting exactly on the target. That's what the guys that uh, uh, testing their rifles and so on like to see. They don't care if they hit the target or not. They like to see how tight a group they can shoot. And then over here, we get one where the shots are all very near the bullseye and very close to each other. That's both accurate and precise. Okay, this, this example shows precision of shooting, but there is a bias in here. When we say a bias in statistical terms, it means that we are missing the true value. There's a, there's a built-in error with our measurements. <clears throat> that can be due to a difference in the way the measurements were taken or to some defect in the equipment that was used, and even to a personal uh, bias. Some people are optimists and some are pessimists. That doesn't necessarily hurt anything as long as we keep the bias consistent from one measurement to the other. But statistics cannot measure bias. It only tells you what the precision is. Uh, if we went out on a big pasture, for example, and let's say we had two ecological sites on it, and one of them made up three-fourths of the area, and the other one made up one-fourth, if we did a random allocation of our sample units on those two sites, we'd put three-fourths of them on the big one and one-fourth on the little one. That's not necessarily the most efficient way to take the sample because if the big one, if the, if the larger area is more uniform, then we require fewer samples on it to get the required precision. So we might actually even put more on the small area if it's highly variable and less on the, on the larger area, which is less variable. That's called uh, optimal allocation. In other words, we get the most information for the amount of time and effort expended. Okay, so the, the formula uh, that we use to estimate how many sampling units are required to get the desired sample it has three components. Uh, one of them in the numerator is the T value. It says T squared. This tells us the probability level. It says 
we would like to be 90% sure or 95% sure or 80% sure that our, that our mean that we calculate is within a certain percentage of the true mean. And the denominator is the measure of how close to the true mean do we want to be. We'd say, I'd like to be 90% sure I'm within plus or minus 10% of the true mean. That goes into the, the uh, denominator. The other term that's in the numerator <clears throat> is S squared. That is a, a measure <clears throat> of the amount of variability among the sampling units. And so there's three things. <clears throat> how, how sure do we want to be? How close do we want to be? And then what is the overall amount of variability we're dealing with? Okay, uh, we want to discuss here a little bit about how big a sample do we really need to take to make it repeatable. And as we showed you before in the formula, there's a couple of those aspects have to do with how much, very, how much error you're willing to accept in your answer. Another one has to do with how confident you want to be in the answer. And the third one has to do with how much variability there is among your sample units out in the field. And I want to talk right now about how can we reduce that difference among sampling units in the field so that we either get a more precise answer with the same number of sampling units or we can use fewer sample units and therefore take less time and, and effort to get a, a good sample. We want to stratify the area to be sampled into uniform areas. We usually do that on an ecological site basis and so we want to keep our samples on one ecological site. Now here I'm standing on a Lomi Upland ecological site. If you look around here this is all fairly uniform in terms of soil, the slope, the topography and so on. You see a lot of variability in the vegetation. Different life forms. We've got shrubs, cactus, perennial grass, half shrubs, some annuals, and a very spotty pattern of vegetation. This is typical, but the site itself is uniform. We want to keep our samples on this one site and not get off down in to a different site. You can see over here there's a there's a draw runs down through there. If we let our transects or our quadrats get down into that draw, we're going to confuse our sample and increase the variability. Okay, when we're sampling, we talk about a sampling unit. <clears throat> and uh, in range vegetation sampling, that's usually a quadrat, or it may be a line, or it may be a point. There are some others, but those are the most common. And what that means is, if, if we have a population, it means all the possible units like that that we could have. For instance, if we had a square, one square foot quadrat, on an acre there'd be 43,560 possible quadrats we could sample. That's your, that's your population. We take a sample of that, maybe we take 100. And so the sample is 100 quadrats of that size and the quadrat is a sampling unit. So it's the measurement we take on a sampling unit that we use to calculate the statist statistical confidence we have in the answer. Okay, one, one way to con control the size of the sample that you need is to get the proper size of sampling unit. And by sampling unit, I'm going to use the example of a quadrat or a line transect. And you can see that if we were sampling vegetation in a small quadrat, let's say this size here, that we're going to hit greatly different amounts of vegetation if we put it here or there or over in these bare spots. <clears throat> and that's going to increase the variability in our sample and make us have to have more quadrats than if we use perhaps a bigger one that would take in more vegetation on each quadrat and therefore each quadrat would tend to have values more similar to the others. And by the same token, if we ran a line transect uh, <clears throat> down through this area, this vegetation, you can see that if it's a very short line, it may not hit anything. And therefore, each line would tend to be more like each other line and reduce the number that we needed. Okay, in addition to uh, the size of the sampling unit, there's uh, two, three other things we can do to reduce the variability within the sample. 
Uh, one is we can talk about the shape of the sampling unit, particularly with a quadrat. Sometimes we use circular or square quadrats, but actually a, a rectangular one usually gives a little bit more efficient sample. In other words, it, it will be a little less difference between sampling units. That's not usually a major consideration, but it can help. Another uh, is the orientation of your sampling units, particularly where you're running transects, line transects. You want to run them generally up and down the hills rather than across the slope because that will tend to average out the differences from upslope to downslope. Uh, we can also sometimes group species and reduce the number of, of sampling units that are necessary. For instance, if we were just interested in estimating the total amount of grass out here, it would take fewer quadrats than if we wanted to know the amount of each individual species of grass. So if we grouped them into perennial grasses, annual grasses, annual forbs, and so on, we can get by with a smaller sample than if we went to individual species. Uh, st statistical analysis requires that your sampling units be selected at random. And that's usually very difficult, if not impossible, to do in range monitoring. Uh, the way we can get around that sometimes is if we're taking quadrats along a line is to make sure we scatter those quadrats out as much as possible without getting off of the, the site we're sampling. And what this does is means that what you find in one quadrat is not related to what you find in the other. In other words, you can't predict from this quadrat what you're going to hit the next one. And if we do that, that means those quadrats are basically independent, and we can go ahead and use statistical analysis based on that. For example, if we were running quadrats across here, and we run into this mesquite tree, and you can see that there's a lot of grass underneath that mesquite tree, if we put two quadrats down under the same tree, obviously they're going to be similar, and they're not independent. So if we were laying quadrats across here, we would want to scatter them out to the point where not more than one of them would land under that tree, and therefore it would be independent of what the rest of them were. Now there's no uh, surefire formula to tell you how wide that spacing should be, but I would say you, you, it just comes from experience. It depends a little on the kind of vegetation you're in, but you want to scatter them out as much as you think you can and stay on the uniform site. When you, when you make decisions about how you're going to measure something, that's what we call ground rules. In other words, this is the way we're going to do it. You really need to write that down on your data sheets somewhere in enough detail that somebody else could do it the same way. Even if you come back in a couple of years to do the measurement, you think now you'll remember how you did it, but you won't, I'll guarantee you. You, you'll get out there and you say, wait a minute, did we do it this way or did we do it that? And so if you don't do it consistently, your data is pretty well worthless. It's important, again, to emphasize that when we're monitoring, we need to have a sample that's repeatable so that when we measure over, uh, again, later on in time, that we know that any change we detect is a real change and not just some uh, change in the way we did it or, how, or the adequacy of the sample. So some of the things that we talked about uh, is how to improve this precision is uh, stratification, staying on the same area, size of the sampling unit, we got the orientation or the shape of the sampling unit. In some cases we can group species together or we can take less uh, accurate uh, measurements on each quadrat so that we can take more of them or we can use a double sampling approach. All of these contribute to uh, increasing the number of, of sampling units we can take at a given time and therefore increasing the precision of the answers. I think understanding a little bit about statistics is, is a for more than anything else, just a way of looking at the world that we're never quite sure, and so we're just making probable inferences about things. If you have that statistical background, even if you never run the statistics on it, it helps you get 
a better sample than you would if you, if you di didn't have and understand those concepts.